What is going on, you guys? It is Jake here, bringing you all a quick little intro to today's episode. This is a uh, interview show between Eric and uh, one Brett Hollander of WBAL, heavily involved with the Orioles, doing the WBAL coverage for them uh, on the radio. He appears on their broadcasts and everything. Uh, great dude, very well informed, a good hang, uh, as you'll hear in the chat between him and Eric. Uh, wanted to record this quick opening just to let you guys know uh, what to expect here. It's a little bit of a half an hour. Chat session between the two guys talking about uh, spring training, getting some stories from them, uh, going through um, what to expect uh, in this upcoming year, which, as they uh, detail, is going to be hopefully is going to be an exciting one. Talking a little bit of injuries as well, which came out uh, as of today's recording. Uh, we recorded this one uh, this past Thursday. Uh, so the injury news was still pretty fe- uh, fresh. Uh, when they chopped it up as far as Bradish goes, as far as uh, what some of the other guys are dealing with. Uh, so yeah, that, that was just kind of the timeline that it was recorded upon. So I just wanted to let you know about that uh, as well as a quick intro. And also, also wanted to uh, plug the Jimmy's Famous Seafood tailgoat that is going to be taking place for opening day uh, on March 28th, uh, which is uh, going to be an absolute banger. Hosted by one DJ Pauly D, who's going to be the headliner there. We're going to be out there as well doing a live show and everything like that. So go to jimmysfamousseafood.com uh, under their events tab. Get your tickets right now. Uh, Nick Markakis is going to be in attendance. Hopefully we can get uh, Cakes to stop by the live show. Uh, going to be an absolute banger, like I said. So go ahead and get your tickets to that. I uh, wanted to just plug that real quick here as we're going to be continuing to do before I throw it over to Eric's interview with Brett Hollander, which I will do right now. Thanks, guys. All righty. We now welcome on. A broadcaster for his hometown, Baltimore Orioles, Brett Hollander. Thanks for coming on. As always, uh, we appreciate you and uh, everything you do around Birdland. Thank you, Eric. Uh, fired up for the season. Excited to get to Sarasota. It's been a really cold few days, so it's a reminder that we're still in the thick of winter. They're even predicting snow over the weekend. Mm-hmm. So I'm ready to think, talk, and eat, sleep, and dream about baseball. There we go. There we go. Um, I mean, we can't even delay it any further. Uh, we'll just jump right into the big news from today and Mike Elias uh, talking. The I, I got tweets and texts that someone was like, I think Rock and all the reporters are hacked because there's no way all these guys are hurt. We got the news of Kyle Bradish with the strained UCL, sprained UCL, um, Gunnar Henderson with the oblique, John Means with the, I guess he's just a month behind. I don't, I, they didn't really give an injury there. And then Samuel Basalo and, and the stress uh, fracture in his throwing elbow. Um, and don't forget Gunner with an oblique injury, but no one seems yeah. to be worried about that. Mm-hmm. You expect injuries. And what's happened now, I think in baseball, that these pitchers in particular, but hitters too, they ramp up so early. I mean, there was a time and a place, and it sounds so old to say this, where players came to spring training to start the process. Now pitchers are getting rolling in early January. So it leaves the door open for more injuries. We know in baseball right now, Eric, we have a problem with pitching injuries. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a problem. There's too many good pitchers that are going down. Uh, I'm not an expert on it, but there's obviously things we can point to, whether it's uh, the insane velo we're seeing, or, uh, you know, I thought, and maybe it will over time, the pitch clock would actually reduce injuries. Um, It could be any number of things. Uh, You know, I don't want to to speculate it, but clearly there's a problem with it. I'm not the first one to say it. But uh, I think now you look at the first day last year, Michael, I spoke. And today it's become a day to report offseason injuries. There were a lot of concerning ones last year, including Dylan Tate, who never pitched for Baltimore last season, including Felix Bautista, unrelated to what he suffered at the end of the season last year. And I'm missing a few. Deal Hall comes to mind. And that did set him back a little bit. He really didn't find himself until the All-Star break, which was hurt, hurtful for him. He did come up, I think, and made a spot appearance uh, in a doubleheader, but he was not himself until they had to kind of reboot him middle of the year. And so you expect this on day one. When you're talking about Kyle Bradish and Gunnar Henderson uh, and John Means, it hurts, but the Orioles have a lot of good players. So anytime you hear any of these names, uh, it's going to be hurtful, uh, and you're, you're hoping that everyone uh, can be ready and, and play. I think it's pretty clear that Bradish is not going to be ready on opening day. Brandon Hyde said he doesn't anticipate John Means being ready on opening day, but both are clearly still in the plans for 24. So let's be optimistic and hope we'll see them soon. And the Bradish one is, I think, the one that kind of got all our our ears perked. Anytime the UCL is mentioned in RP, because again, you've seen this kind of song and dance before with Hunter Harvey and and Matt Wieters and Dylan Bundy and all them, and it's kind of like, we, yeah, we've read this book. We kind of know how it ends. Um, if if Bradish is out for 
an extended period of time or say the rest of the year, you know, the full year? Um, do you think the Orioles have a move in them to go to go again, acquire a pitcher, sign a guy, trade a guy and take his spot? And they have limitless possibilities of things they can do because they have the prospect ammo to do whatever they want. It doesn't just have to be one move. And they're not out of options now that they've traded away uh, D.L. Hall and Joey Ortiz and got Corbin Burns. They can still move any which way. I don't think they have to rush anything. I mean, there's still, oddly enough, here in middle of February, Jordan Montgomery, Blake Snell, uh, Trevor Bauer, among others, still out there. Mm -hmm. So I don't anticipate those guys uh, signing one or two year deals. But my guess is all those guys are kind of waiting for this. I mean, this meaning teams having starting pitchers go down, and Kyle Bradish won't be the last. I can tell you that over the next, before games even begin, there'll be more starting pitchers that get hurt around baseball. So those guys probably waited out at this point, you know, in a weird way, hoping that there'll be injuries because they become uh, almost uh, more of a something that a team would be desperate for. But if they are willing to play on a short-term deal, maybe the Orioles would be involved. I have no idea to that end, but there's no, the, the Orioles have limitless possibilities on anything they can do trade-wise between now and the trade deadline. I don't think they're really in a rush. I mean, if there's another injury, obviously that changes things, but you still have Corbin Burns, Grayson Rodriguez, Dean Kramer. I mean, that trio alone is in the upper group of any team in baseball. Mm -hmm. You still have someone with starting experience like Cole Irvin, and Tyler Wells was the best starting pitcher in the team in the first half last year. He has a great resume as a starter, at least in pockets, and you could do a lot worse than that five. I mean, if that was a five of any era uh, for Orioles uh, starters, let's just say in the last 15 years, including uh, the Buck Showalter years, I think you'd like that group as your your five-man rotation. You, you have a lot of off days in April, so you can manipulate the rotation in a variety of ways. Uh, it is a softer schedule in April for what it's worth. And mm -hmm. just looking ahead, and you probably shouldn't because we don't know how these teams will be in the in the coming year. But I don't think it's a panic situation right now at all, given the starters that they have. And it's a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity for Cade Povich or Chase McDermott or Bruce Zimmerman or whomever else who really uh, is, is running out of opportunities just based on options are concerned. And then for the young guys like Povich and McDermott, they were going to get a lot of chances this spring anyway. Even if they don't break with the club, you want to be next man up when there is an injury and there will be injuries during the season. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Again, it's big for those guys. It seems like Irvin or um, Zimmerman has stepped up a couple times, you know, when, when means went down and, and stuff like that. So big, big spot for them. Um, we'll we'll kind of, we'll get into some of the lighter questions now. Obviously that was one that popped up uh, this morning, but uh, like I said, lifelong Orioles fan, uh, you've been around for a lot of uh, interesting off seasons, a lot of comments, a lot of good off seasons, bad off seasons. Where does this <laughs> one rank in, in terms of, you know, I guess just off seasons in Orioles baseball is just, it has to be the most anticipated season in 30 years. 20, well, you know, it's, it, you know, I'd have to go back and, and kind of think about it. I mean, I was pretty fired up for the 13 season, the 14 season, you know, I think we both love that group so much and mm -hmm. uh, so many young players similar to this entering their prime seasons. And that 2012 Orioles team, I, to me, will, will live with me forever just because of, uh, they ended the year, the 14 year run of losing, and they made the postseason. And that group was together for, for a long time. And that's very rare in sports and baseball nowadays. But uh, certainly, expectations are through the roof. And, and that's been earned. Uh, a team in 22 that contended all the way, 101 wins last year. They've earned the right to, I think, have a, a lot of notoriety and a lot of buzz around them. It's going to be different in that sense. They're not sneaking up on anybody. Uh, the fans are already amped up and excited, so there's nothing to, to capture. We're, we're in. I mean, fans are in on this, and they can't wait to see what happens next. And I think this team is poised to have an extended window for a long time. Just so many good young players with more to come and a great general manager in front office at the helm that you expect them to make really good, smart, prudent decisions that won't be uh, desperate to win and have to win in 24, but playing the long game along with trying to win right now. And evidence of that is the Burns move, training away two promising young players for a guy entering his final season before free agency. As far as the offseason was concerned, it's been a strange offseason in baseball. Besides the mm -hmm. fact that Snell and Montgomery are still out there, there have just been weeks where there was no news. I thought all offseason, the Orioles would have an upgrade in the starting rotation. I didn't think it would take until February, but here we are. And it tur turns out, I think they got the guy they wanted all along. 
Uh, Mike Elias has said as much. And I think that um, it was just a very strange offseason. In the end, you feel the need of Felix Bautista and you get a number one starter. And those were the two big things they had to accomplish and they did it. Yeah, absolutely. And and you talked about the expectations. Um, and again, last year's team had, they had expectations. We didn't really know what they were, but um, this year going into the season, again, they're, they're, they're talked about everywhere. What, what, how do you think these young guys, Adley, the Gunners and Grayson, how do you think these guys will handle these big expectations where again, every, every day on MLB network, they're talking about them on MLB.com, ESPN, all that. You know, I think about guys like Adley and he's never not been successful in anything he's done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's something about Adley in that sense. And that's why he was the safe pick and the right pick at one, one in 2019 that he's really only known winning and he carried his college team to the world series and won it. And, since he's come up, we all know how well the Orioles have done uh, since he debuted Preakness Weekend in 22. But I will say, maybe for me, one of the lingering questions is replacing the veteran leadership of of Kyle Gibson and Adam Frazier. Now, you still have James McCann, and I think he's a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. But like Jordan Lyles before, Robinson Trinos before, and Rugner Odor before, to me, they were so perfectly placed on this team and how it elevated a little bit going into 22 and 23 uh, to go from Odor to Frazier and Lyles to Gibson and now Burns. But those offseason signings weren't accidents. They were the perfect type of free agent and veteran player that this young group needed. Now, although Austin Hayes and Cedric Mullins, they're not young anymore. And Anthony Santander, they're not young kids. They've had two pennant chases now and postseason experience. That said, they do have to show they can kind of do it without those uh, tough dudes, as they say in the clubhouse. Uh, and to me, that's one of the questions, and only time will tell. But you know, Adam Frazier brought an edge every day at the ballpark, mm -hmm. and Kyle Gibson was beloved by his teammates, particularly among pitchers and starters. And his role, I think, you can't say enough about that. And it goes even in the new age of baseball as we look at things. And Mike Elias comes from the new school. Again, brilliant by him with no accident, picking up certain guys to fill certain roles uh, to help bring along a very young, talented group. So I think it's time that you know we look at Austin Hayes and Cedric Mullins and Adley Rutschman as now leaders of this team, and it's up to them. You assume Corbin Burns is going to be a good teammate, and he obviously has a lot to play for this year. I think guys like Jordan Lyles and Kyle Gibson are – unique in understanding their role as being veteran leaders, but I assume that Burns and Kimbrell, the Orioles did their due diligence on them and they're going to kind of plug and play in those roles as well. Yeah. Again, it seems like you, you talked about Kimbrell everywhere it goes. It seems like they're in the playoffs you yeah. know, one way or another. So he finds himself on these winning teams. So um, back to Burns scale of one to 10, how, how caught off guard were you with the deal? And, and again, before the Bradish injury, I was going to ask, you know, how big is it to add a guy like that to, uh, you know, a duo of, or you can, I mean, you can, we can throw Dean Kramer in there, but there's well, young guys like Grayson, Bradish and Kramer. What does it mean for, again, a, not a Jordan Lyles or Kyle Gibson, but a guy like Bradish, who was a veteran who has, again, he's one of Cy Young. What, what, just what is the trickle down effect there with Brad, with well, uh, Burns? I, I think in October, having that guy is so important. Uh, over the course of six months, though, having a stopper, an ace you can lean on, someone you know when it's his turn. And he kind of had this with Gibson, although I think the Orioles elevated in overall ability, and that's with all due respect to Kyle Gibson, who I just mentioned was such a big part of last year's team. But to have someone every fifth day you think can give you seven, six at the worst, and stop long losing streaks, which are inevitable over the long season, and uh, he's so talented, Corbin Burns, and he's a horse, and I, I just think that uh, to really – it's not about the total win number at, mm -hmm. in the end. I think it's about – how you feel you stack up sometimes against other teams in a given series in a, uh, in a postseason matchup. I love how you tweet it out all the time when you see the pitching matchups and you say like uh, definitely two out of three, probably sweep. And you feel that you got one every time you have one of those aces on the mound. And, and that's for real. I think the other team feels that. I mean, Orioles fans have been on the other side of that. Go back throughout the years uh, facing the Yankees or Red Sox. Mm -hmm. And you know, when they're lining up, uh, Cy Young Award winners, you feel you start at a disadvantage. You're hoping you're that team that can just get one in that series or avoid being swept. 
So to add someone like Corbin Burns, it's a mentality thing. There's only a handful of aces, true aces, in baseball right now, and he's one of them. You get him at a time. I love this. Some fans are all about, oh, we got to sign him to a long-term deal. I don't see it that way. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. We'll see how it plays out. But you get – I love getting guys entering free agent seasons. Mm-hmm. He is so much on the line right now. If he has a great season, he, we lot. know the money that frontline starting pitchers get, and that's what's at stake for Corbin Burns. So you're going to get him at his best. Nothing bodes better for starting pitchers than pitching deep into October and pitching well in October. We've seen Nathan Evaldi get his money that way and so many others. So to me, this is Corbin Burns, you think, at his absolute best with everything on the line, and that's what the Orioles have in him right now. And again, we're going back to this, um, some of the, the the major league free agents still out there. The Orioles, again, they've done their due diligence and they've gotten, they've added some of these fringe guys. Tyler Nevin came back and, and you know, some of the other guys they've traded cash considerations for. Do you think there's any chance that they go out and still add a major league, uh, you know, a bat, a bullpen arm, something like that, especially with the injury now? Or again, is that, has the, the, the big league contract kind of sail? For a yeah, sure. I think anything's possible. Um Still a long way to go before March 28th and opening day in Baltimore. So anything is possible. Uh, and certainly there could be more injuries. Someone like Jordan Montgomery could say, hey, put me on a winner and I'll pitch for one and or two and become a free agent again. I, you know, I find that scenario unlikely, but anything's possible right now. It's been a really weird offseason, a really weird market. The owners could still make a trade and there'll be guys available, but they also could see where they are come June, July and see where they're short, whether it's the bullpen, whether it's a big slugger, whether it's the rotation and make their move then. And I think that's probably just as logical as anything else. Uh, kind of bide your time, hang around the race and go make your move in July or, or even June and and try and make a, a splash then if you feel you're really short in the back end or maybe just one piece in the bullpen or uh, in the rotation at that point. So I don't think they're in a rush. I think you kind of play the game of, I mean, it's like football right now. And you look at the NFL, look at the teams left in the final uh, championship Sunday. And it's the ones that had their quarterbacks stay healthy all year. So it's a game of attrition when it comes to pitching in particular, but injuries do happen. And we saw just like in the NFL, all these uh, great quarterbacks get hurt this year. Well, who's left? Well, Jackson, and Purdy, and that guy Mahomes. Oh, by the way, those are the teams that had the best chance to win the whole thing. And it's just that way with starting pitching. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, we'll go go a little off the field now. Um, the broadcast group. Yeah. The, your group seems closer than any other broadcast team in baseball. Like, it, you don't seem like coworkers. You guys all seem like legitimate friends who just happen to all, you know, share the same job. How, how much easier does that make your job again every day going into the radio booth or the TV booth knowing, I mean, again, I think we've seen the Tigers broadcasters fight on air and arguments and bickering. But again, with you guys, it just seems like you're such a close knit group. And again, it's you're watching this young and up and coming team. How much easier does that just make your job off, off the field? Well, there are a few things. We're all about the same age. We're in some ways, different parts of our life. We all got here in different ways, uh, professionally speaking, but we all most Kevin came in 2019. You know, I'd covered the team for many, many years and obviously grew up here. But uh, Melanie, Jeff, and I started in 20. So, uh, and Rob Long had been there for a while. Uh, and then uh, Scott Garceau came back in 20 as well. Uh, and, and Palmer and Bennett had obviously Jim has done this forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. <laughs> and uh, and Ben had, had been kind of building up uh, to the role he's in now. But a lot of us started basically in 20 and then we were put on ice because of COVID Mm -hmm. and our first season as full-time broadcasters for the team were done as everything else was done basically with masks on. We weren't in the same group together. We couldn't have social lives together off the field. We couldn't really interact. We were broadcasting and for many of us fulfilling our dreams in empty ballparks, watching one of the worst teams in baseball play and broadcasting those games. And you almost have to laugh at that moment. And I certainly tried to bring that uh, to the table every day and night because I thought, well, it's still baseball. There's a lot of bad going on out there right now. Uh, This is still baseball, and it's fun. If you're not having fun doing it, uh, then the audience certainly won't. Mm -hmm. And for everybody right now, this is an escape to normalcy. But we kind of survived that season 
And it's still awkward for 21, but we come out of that as a group that uh, really I thought was, was, you know, tight and kind of been through a very strange experience together. And I think we actually did a great job considering the circumstances, but I equate it to going from lifting, you know, and bench pressing 200 pounds to five pound dumbbells. It doesn't get much harder in baseball broadcasting, calling games for a really bad team in an empty ballpark with no access to the players and not being able to talk to your coworkers to going from uh, incredible energy at the ballpark, one of the best teams in baseball and obviously everything else that comes with it as far as access and and being able to talk to players and and, and get more anecdotes that we just could not get in 20 and 21. But I think out of those weird seasons, we did grow very close. Uh, again, we're all kind of the same age and I think this is kind of unusual across Major League Baseball. But Mm -hmm. good advice that I've heard from time to time. It's a very long season and a very small booth. Uh, Everyone has somewhat of an ego. It's just the nature of of life in in this industry. But uh, we are very close and uh, exciting times for the broadcast group. Uh, I'm someone who got married over 10 years ago. I have two kids. My oldest is turning nine this weekend. But I feel I have to catch up on the life cycle events. Jeff got engaged this past off season. Melanie got engaged this past off season. Mm-hmm. Kevin has a newborn. So I feel like I'm behind everyone, even though I, I kind of was out in front of, of, of those things, but I'm a little older th- than those people, even though I look younger than Jeff, make sure everyone knows that. Uh, and, and no one looks younger than Kevin, but he's, he's kind of Benjamin buttoning though, Eric, like mm-hmm. he's, he's kind of going reverse. If you look at Kevin now compared to Kevin in like 20, Kevin in 20 looked like he was 14. He kind of had the Jackson holiday thing going on. Uh, but <laughs> even he is starting, and I say this, Kevin, uh, politely, even you are starting to look a little bit like you've approached your 30s, thankfully. Yeah, he's he's getting there. He's getting there. And I, yeah, you don't have there. to say it, but I know when you said everyone has an ego, I know you were talking about Reese, and that's, that's perfectly okay to say. Well, a lot of things about Reese take up the whole booth, but uh, his ego <laughs> is definitely one of them. You know, he likes to say, Eric, I get you guys on the air and Jeff and I, who have both taken uh, radio equipment on the road to really small towns in America and gotten ourselves on the air. And I've, I've, yeah, I can't even tell you the weird circumstances. I went on live radio on the Ravens team bus coming back from Super Bowl 47 and had to do a radio show with all those guys we were talking about around me. Uh, so I've been on the air in some pretty weird circumstances by myself. But uh, Reese, uh, he's certainly good fodder. For the long season, uh, I do. I will say this about Ribeye. Uh, I, I love his enthusiasm for work. There's so many in this industry who act like this is the worst thing. And you're showing up to a baseball park every day. It can't be that bad, even on your worst day. And I do appreciate uh, his enthusiasm and zest for uh, coming to work every day. And I hope that never goes away for him. But uh, he's he's something all right. And, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be less babysitting in, in 24. One of these days, I will publicly store of the, the FaceTime that I got from him after Clinchmas, um, which I believe you guys were down. I, yeah, we were in the booth. We were, we were in the TV booth and, and he, he did it. Uh, yeah. He, he, you know, it's, it, listen with Reese, I think he loses sight. I'm like 15, 20 years older than he is. So, mm-hmm. uh, we, we have different social habits. And, you know, but we, we try hard to uh, include him and make sure he's behaving himself, get him to bedtime, uh, calls parents on the road, uh, check in, send letters. Uh, and, and we hope that, you know, we, we try and make sure that he's uh, being a good, good worker and doing his job every day and, and posting up. But he's never been late. That's mm-hmm. high on my list. He always has a pretty good attitude. And uh, th- those that sh- he checks a few boxes in that sense. He, Just I, keep the ice cream away from him. <laughs> I will give credit to him because, again, as you and Jeff know, I frequent uh, Pickles across the street. And Love last it. opening day, I think I was out there at it must have been six thirty or seven o'clock. I don't know what time your guy call your your call was, but um, I'm I'm standing at Pickles and I see Reese get out of an Uber right there, and I'm screaming. I'm like, "Get over here! You got time for a, a drink? Come on over!" And he's like, "Jeff and Brett would kill me. I have to go." And I'm like, "Come on, dude! Just one." And he's like, I can't, I can't. So good, he good job, Reese. Head. We'll say that. We'll say that. Well, he's, but, um, you know, he, he earned the nickname. He went from ribeye to Reese four scoops. I forget exactly the circumstances, but we're in Arlington, Texas. 
uh, he wins a bet over me and I had to buy him ice cream. And uh, he, they came back with four big scoops of vanilla ice cream, no toppings, which is just for the insane. I mean, yeah. four scoops of vanilla, uh, you know, no, no variable, no chocolate, uh, no whipped cream, no chocolate syrup, no cherries. And, but he downed four scoops. I mean, four scoops is a lot of ice cream. <laughs> you better not be lactose intolerant. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. he's received four scoops too. Uh, he gets more pub than any radio producer in baseball right now. So uh, in each time you mention it, you can just, you talk about ego though, as we were saying, Eric, I mean, it's, it's out of control. I love it. I love it. I love Reese. He's the best. Um, again, you mentioned, I think you're, you're heading down to Sarasota soon. Um, Beside for the Jackson holiday showcase, what what is something that fans should be on the lookout for? Are there, are there any, Again, position battles, um, newcomers, some of the prospects. Again, take Jackson away from it because he's an alien and he, tech, you know, he should be in school right now and not hitting home runs. But what what is something that fans should uh, pay attention to and and, and kind of keep track of? Well, there are a few things I'm kind of curious how they sorted out. Let's assume for a second. I think it's a big assumption that Holiday's at second base. Who's at third? Is that Westberg? I'm a big Jordan Westberg guy. Mm-hmm. I think he's gonna have a huge season, yeah. and I'm excited to see him play a lot. He could maybe one day end up being a super utility guy because he can play everywhere. He's such a good athlete, but I see him as an everyday player. Will he hit enough home runs for third base? I don't know, but I'm really curious to see what it looks like with Jordan Westberg in the lineup every day. So then you're kind of left with a decision about Jorge Mateo and Ramon Urias. And I'm not sure if this roster right now can coexist with both of them as it did last year. Mm -hmm. Maybe it can. Ramon really did not have a good season last year offensively. And we know about Jorge's struggles offensively after April, but in the end, Mateo can play the outfield. He plays a great shortstop. He does something that almost no one else can do as far as how he steals bases. So to me, there's great value in Jorge Mateo having on your team. He's an electric player when he's on the bases. Uh, So that to me is a very interesting breakdown. And now assume for a second, Bradish and Means are not in the opening day roster. You plug and play Irvin and well, so I had my original bullpen now in the rotation. That opens up some bullpen mm-hmm. spots. So who's that going to be? Uh, we know it's going to work down from Kimbrell, at least to start in the ninth, and Cano and CNL and all the way down. I had Deal Hall being a huge bridge guy in the fifth or sixth inning. Now it's the right trade getting mm-hmm. Corbin Burns, obviously. So I've already kind of said to myself, well, who's replacing Deal Hall? Because I thought he was going to have a huge year. In fact, I, I said this on our Hot Stove Radio show that I, I wouldn't have been surprised if D.L. Hall was the closer by the All-Star break. That's how good I thought he looked late in games in leverage situations. So I think there's holes in the bullpen that need to be filled. They have to make a decision on the fourth outfielder. You'd love for it to be Ryan McKenna. He's perfect for that role. Uh, but the problem with Ryan is uh, where he's in options. And typically, as it plays out now in Major League Baseball, those last few guys in your roster, in the bullpen and on your position group, you need options because – you're constantly moving that guy. Uh, whenever when someone gets excited about the orders have called up so-and-so, I always say, you know, don't get too attached to that person. And they're usually gone the next day. It's just the way major league rosters are, are moving these days because they need they're, they're thinking about winning tonight or surviving today or surviving tomorrow. And that's how it goes. So you need guys who, are op- who have options. So that is a huge factor in how they put together a roster, particularly in the bullpen. Um, so uh, I think there's plenty of jobs out there, maybe from, you know, maybe two, three, four spots that are kind of up for grabs right now. And the other big one is uh, Heston Kerstad and Colton Kowser. I think mm-hmm. they both should be on this team, but I don't see how the at-bats play out where they yeah. can both get the ABs on this team. And then the other big one is, and I had a chance to really get to know him over Berlin Caravan is Kobe Mayo, who I don't see on this opening day roster, but I think there's a lot of people who think he could be here by July. And I think his power is special. Uh, I, I think the assumption is he can stay at third base. I think Jordan Westberg will have something to say about that long term. But uh, Kobe Mayo, he's in very uh, special company when it comes to the raw power. And those who are saying, well, the Orioles need to add pop, I don't disagree necessarily. But I would not be surprised if Heston Kerstad has 25 homers this year. And I would not be surprised if Kobe Mayo uh, is on this ball club at some point. It's it's funny you talked about uh, Westberg a lot. He seems as the back generation era. He seems like the perfect Buck player. Like he seems like Showalter would have loved him. I think just like like you said, the athlete he could do all. He's just born to be a baseball player. He he's one of the most intense dudes I've ever come across. Uh, he takes every at bat 
like it's game seven of the World Series. At some point, you almost think he has to scale it back a little bit. And Gunner's not too dissimilar. One special thing about this Orioles team is when your stars like Gunner and Adley go as hard to first base as they do, it really sets the tone for everybody else. We've heard from Brandon Hyde multiple times that he'd like to see Henderson kind of scale it back a little bit. You have to think about the six-month season and everything else. But Jordan Westberg, I, I was down in the dugout. Uh, the Orioles lost in San Diego. It was not a close game in the ninth inning. I forget the score. And he makes it out in the ninth inning. I mean, it's meaningless. It's a five-six run game. And that poor Gatorade cooler took a beating after Jordan made the, an out in the ninth in a six-run game. This guy, I don't think he'll be, you know, posing for the Smile Award anytime soon, but he's a really intense guy, a great athlete, and I'm very high on his baseball skills. Yeah, that I, li- I like to hear the intensity. Um, we'll, we'll get you out of here on a, on a, a softball. I'll put this one on a tee for you. Um, what's your favorite thing or favorite part about Camden Yards? Again, you've been coming here as long as anyone. What's Is there a place or a thing in Camden Yards where you're just like, this is my favorite thing here? It's awesome. Well, I, I love Boogs. I mean, I, I've been going to Boogs for 30 years. I absolutely authentically love Boogs. Uh, I, I think, you know, as far as seats go, I've always felt the right center field bleachers are the best value playing the ballpark. Uh, that's yep. me personally speaking. Uh, you know, there, are, there aren't bad seats at Camden Yards. Um, I, I think what I love most about it is it's hard to explain because it's really the aesthetics. It's the look. It's the red and green contrast from the seats to the field to the brick facade of the warehouse. And I, I think there's something about that. Many have tried to replicate it. No one has done it where and it's authentic like that's the thing like utah street's real that is a real city street the warehouse has been there for over a century we all know what it looked like uh before the renovation to the ballpark i'm very excited about what's coming next to camden yards you know and and the key for any renovations to modernize the ballpark and whatever that means is to keep the feeling and the look and the intimacy of the ballpark and have a lot of confidence the orioles and uh the state will do that well but there's something about it. And I remember walking in there for the first time in exhibition game against the Mets in 1992. And my life was never the same after that. I don't know if to say it, it's pathetic, but I, it changed me forever. I went to Memorial Stadium, but my feelings about Baltimore and baseball were never the same after stepping foot in there. I, it was overwhelming, I think, at mm-hmm. seven or eight years old that uh, this was something we had in our ballpark or in our hometown that no one else could compete with. And I still feel that way all these years later, but it's hard to put your finger on it. It's just the perfect place uh, for baseball in the modern sense of it. But, you know, I love everything about it. I love uh, yelling uh, to you at Pickles after the game, how it's right there. I love the walk from Federal Hill. uh, If I'm lucky enough to be off before the game, Uh, I love how quickly I can get it in and out um, uh, on most days. Uh, I love walking to radio one at Camden Yards uh, or the TV booth, but radio one, I think about all the greats who've been there and have called games there. Uh, it's all, you know, very special to me. So I don't know if there's one thing I think aesthetically though, it's something about the red of brick of the warehouse contrasting with the green field and the green seats that just is perfect. And just the sense of, you know, it, what they were able to create with it was it felt like there'd been baseball there for a hundred years. Um, mm-hmm which of course there wasn't, uh, but that's the way it felt like. And that's the genius of the ballpark that it was this old fashioned place in the modern era. No. Yeah, I agree. Cause again, you go to some of these new ballparks and that state and all that it just feels, it feels fake and, and just man-made and, and all that stuff. But you, you know, know, even in Arlington and all the amenities, a lot of people like it, uh, but the new ballpark there, but uh, to me, it's kind of like going to a hospital. It just feels sterile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I'll probably get in trouble airplane. for saying that. Yeah, no. Uh, but no. I, listen, I'm a sucker for old baseball and uh, and some of the. I mean, I love going to Fenway and Yankee Stadium just for the thrill of it. I, you know, of, of the newer ballparks, uh, newer not anymore, but uh, Seattle and San Francisco, I think, are very mm-hmm. special places. Um, and you know, and and Baltimore, I think, is. I, I'm hoping that one day we talk about Camden Yards the way we talk about Fenway Park. Yeah. Yeah. And Wrigley I, Field. I think we are. I think, we're, I think we're headed that way. So, yep. Great answer there. Um, again, thank you for joining us. We will, uh, we will let you hey, go. Feel free to uh, Eric, uh, let the send any good messages to, to Reese and Jeff. Uh, don't expect Jeff and I 
uh, to fight this year like they had in that Detroit booth. I don't think it's going to happen this year. Uh, yeah. Although if he talks about his winning too much, it might happen. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll send Reese after him, actually. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that happening. But again, uh, let the people know where to find you. Uh, pl- you can plug your stuff and uh, again, let us know yeah, when you're on air. Under, uh, on X, I guess, and, and you know, uh, all season long in the Orioles Radio Network in Masson. And uh, I think our entire group is just really excited to get to work and, and see what this team has in store. Yeah, I know we're all excited to hear you guys and see you all. And again, we can't, can't wait for baseball. So we will uh, we'll be hearing you and uh, seeing you guys soon. Thanks, Eric. Thank you.